Good morning, Southside. Let's stand together and sing. Victory in Jesus.
Amen. Good morning, Southside. All right, it's good to have you with us this morning. Uh, I want to start off by uh, uh, having us uh, watch a little video. I want to give you an update of what's going on in eastern Kentucky and how Kentucky Baptist uh, Disaster Relief is helping out with that. So if we can go ahead and fire up that video there. As you can see. As you can see by all this debris, the city of Whitesburg was hit hard by the recent flooding. But Kentucky Baptist Disaster Relief volunteers are here to help soften the blow. The Kentucky River has now returned to its banks, but it left devastation in its wake. I've described it as, as a tornado by water because there's utter destruction in some places. Kentucky Baptist Disaster Relief Director Ron Crow says that destruction is not confined to just one area. It's not just one community or one area or one town. It is multiple counties, and from county to county to county, we're seeing uh, catastrophic damage. Disaster relief has set up shop at the First Baptist Church of Whitesburg. From here, more than 90 volunteers are spreading out across the area to help flood victims get back on their feet. I never really understood what obeying Jesus Christ meant until the first time I did this. Susie Way of Smithfield is helping out in the food trailer. Volunteers are providing more than 1,000 meals a day for people who have lost everything. I love my church, okay? I love being in my church and praising the Lord, but this is like heaven. It's what I think heaven's gonna be like. People loving each other. We got some batteries, toothbrush, we have some 409. Gary Riddell of Winchester is stocking buckets filled with cleaning supplies and other basics. They are free to anyone who needs them. Gary says he's here because Jesus called him. I felt the need I needed to, to be here and help the people. People like Missy McFall whose family lost everything. It means, oh, uh, it, it makes me cry. I don't, want to, I, I don't want to cry, but, you know, it's very touching, very touching to see that people still have hearts, you know. To help people uh, and be the hands and feet of Christ. You know, that's what uh, what's we're commanded to do, and, and uh, that's what I feel called to do. And it's more than just physical needs. The team is also sharing the gospel, and it's already bearing fruit. Today we had one salvation. She prayed to receive Christ. Her husband jumps out of the car and said, I've been trying to, to get her to place her faith in Christ for several years now. What happened today? The disaster relief team meeting both physical and spiritual needs. And it's all made possible by the generosity of Kentucky Baptists. We're so grateful for the cooperative program that as Southern Baptists, we have that wonderful tool that collectively we're supporting the work of disaster relief as well as many other ministries of the Southern Baptist Convention. And you can give directly to Disaster Relief at www.kybaptist.org slash flood. It's like putting money in the bank because for the future, because if you need help, Kentucky Baptist Disaster Relief will be there to help you. I'm Lawrence Smith for Kentucky Today. Hmm. I want to let you know that part of uh, our offering every week that we take up, we tithe from that offering uh, for missions, and part of that offering does go to support the cooperative program of the uh, Southern Baptist Convention and uh, the Kentucky Baptist Convention, especially with disaster relief. So you're part of that. Even though you are not there, you are a part of that. And I think I read last night, I think so far there's been 26 professions of faith uh, for individuals who have been ministering uh, to the families over there. So praise the Lord for that uh oh miss karen apology uh last week she had her granddaughter here so she was her granddaughter was a first time visitor so i apologize uh for not recognizing her so bring her another time and we'll say, we'll pretend that was her first time and that way you can introduce her to us but we do have another first time visitor uh with us i saw just walk in so david why don't you stand up and or who's got that little baby leanne <laughs> introduce us to that little that new little baby, how old she is, and Dave and TJ call. 
Myla, how old? Seven weeks. All right, praise the Lord. All right, thank the Lord for that. All right, I uh, want to invite you to continue to pray for uh, Demi and Hunter Carroll. Uh, Roy and Sherry are in Nashville at the hospital uh, having a grandparent day with them so Demi and Hunter could have a day off. Uh, so uh, so praise the Lord for them. Just remember the email that, you, uh, that we sent out for that. If I don't have your email address, please give it to me so you can be on the, the prayer list and the email list that we send out. Uh, emails on a weekly basis uh, in your bulletin I won't read all of them but one thing that uh, I want to call your attention to is September 24th is a Saturday uh, the last Saturday in uh, September we're going to have a one-day vacation Bible school kids bash uh, from nine o'clock to three o'clock and Miss Melinda you hold your hand up right there right after church you can see Miss Melinda and she will give you some information about that if you'd like to help out on that and then on Wednesday September 7th Instead of having our Bible study prayer meeting here, we want you to bring your lawn chair, and we're going to have our Bible study prayer meeting, and, and uh, we're going to sing a few songs out at the new property. And what we're going to do is we're going to set up seven locations uh, at the different places on the property, and we're going to prayer walk the property, and there'll be a different thing at each location. A sign will say something, and when you stop at that sign, you, it will give you instruction on what to be praying for. Uh, as the, uh, for that time frame. So we want to pray because at the end of this month, uh, equipment's going to start showing up and they're going to get started. So praise the Lord for that. All right. We're going to have a banquet, celebration banquet, on September the 17th at 5 o'clock. Uh, in the seat in front of you, at the end of each seat, there is some kind of a weird-looking color little pamphlet right there, a little notebook. All right, everybody see that? Nod your head like you see something down there, okay? Should be on the end of one of those. We need to know how many people plan on attending. It's free. It's, it's a fully catered meal. It's free to you. Uh, so if it's you write down, all you have to do is just write down your name. If you want to write down your name and put next to it how many people are going to be coming, that would be fantastic. And just put it right back uh, in the little slot. Pass it down your row. Thank you very much for that. So is there one in front of Julie right there? So Julie's going to write their name down on it, and they're going to pass it down if there's anyone next to them. And you could, you could do that uh, during the sermon. I'm going to give you permission to do that during the sermon, all right? Uh, and then I'll give you some more instruction at the end uh, of the service uh, regarding the banquet as well. So praise the Lord for that. So please, uh, we want as many people as possible to show up for that. It's going to be a great event uh, on September the 17th. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll continue uh, with our service father we love you we praise you jesus thank you so much because you are our messiah you are the one that's high and lifted up it is your glory that fills the temple and lord we pray today that the presence of the spirit of of almighty god would be felt and uh, and lord that you would reveal yourself to us today as we sing as we pray as we hear testimony lord as we hear the word of god father we pray that god's word would speak to our hearts we pray this in jesus name amen and amen Stand together and sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy Faithfulness, O oh God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassion.
may go to Children's Church at this time. Good morning. Uh, when we got the call this week or text from Ligon, she wanted us to do this. And, uh, of course, the first thought was, I can't do it. But I didn't say that. I did anyway. But uh, it's uh, one of those things that's not very easy to do. And uh, we had been talking about it, but we really hadn't. We thought about it, but not really talked about it. And then this week at this, we had to sort of talk about it more. And when this all started, there's a number that come into mind like everybody else had talked about, but we hadn't really said anything. So then this week I t- told her what I thought, and she said, well, I thought the same thing. So that's sort of how far we've got on that end of it. And uh, we just want to keep everybody thinking about the new church and what's going on and uh, how good it'll be when we get there. And for everything else that's going to be happening between now and then. So let's just keep praying about it and do what we need to do. Thank you. Well, I'm not much better at this than he is, but I was, and I still don't know. Um, what came to my mind was this card speaks to the label everything and follow him. And... Uh, Brooke and I were so fortunate a few years ago to go to Mexico on a mission trip. And what blessings we received from that. And I know as a house, we look like we're kind of the senior, not all of us. Thank goodness we've got some young people now. But, uh, you know, the likelihood of us leaving everything and following him may not be that great. But the mission has been brought right here to us we are getting ready to be a light on a hill folks and I just foresee people coming with lots of children and I just pray that it burdens our hearts that we will honor God by giving what he wants us to give Uh, the Bible plainly tells us he loves a cheerful giver and I pray that we all really get down and decide what he wants us to give. But what better seed could you sow right here in Blasco, Kentucky than to minister to young children and their families and uh, see them come to know the Lord and have an eternal home in heaven. And I'm praying hard for young families to come here, be it now or be it when we're on the hill, either one. I just uh, ask that you I wish Brother Jones was here today. This is one of his favorite songs. And let's stand together and sing His Eyes on the Sparrow. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion.
songs give place to sighing when a We'll take your Bibles this morning, open them to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, if you would please. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to read verses 19 through 21. I hope you have a copy of God's Word with you. Uh, we'll be looking at another passage of Scripture just a little bit later in the, in the uh, message this morning. The title of the message this morning as we talk about generosity, we've got a little banner up here that says generosity. And uh, the, title, the sort of the subtitle is, I Give Because. We just sang a song that says, uh, I Sing Because. So today the title of the message is, I Give Because. And uh, we've been preaching a series of sermons, and Sunday school classes are now going through those series uh, on those lessons. And we talked about prayer, talked about uh, positive praying or powerful praying. We talked about sacrifice. We preached the message on participation and uh, last week we talked about humble generosity, and today we're going to talk about uh, giving and the reasons why we ought to give. And some might call this a message on stewardship, some might call this a message on tithing, but it's really not going to be a message on tithing. I want to talk to you about the reasons why a believer ought to be a good giver uh, to God's kingdom work. There's just a blessing in giving uh, to God's kingdom work, and I'm going to give you five reasons this morning. Three of them are going to come from this passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21. And then uh, two of the other points are going to come from two other passages of Scripture. So let's read the text, Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse number 19 through verse 21. Did you find that? New American Standard speaking, uh, talking about Jesus speaking, says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Would you all read out loud verse 21 with me again? Ready? Read. For where your treasure is, will be also. Lord, we pray that you would just grant to us today the, the ears to hear the minds, Lord, to comprehend what the Word of God is going to say to us. Lord, the challenge that is in your Word, in your Scripture. We pray, Lord, that as we become good givers, uh, not just to in and through the church, but to the work of God, Lord, that we see that fruit. Uh, Lord, that we see that blessing. We see, Lord, that uh, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. And, Father, no matter what happens in our lives of a, as a child of God, you're in control, total control. You're going to take good care of your children. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Well, I want you to be reminded that our challenge to our church and our stewardship campaign uh, during this time is not equal giving, but it is equal sacrifice. Uh, some people can give a little bit more. Some people can give a little bit uh, less. But then uh, there are some people who say, well, I can't give anything, but I... Uh, cho choose to differ with that because I believe that all can give at least something. But the question is, why is it 
uh, why are some reasons or what are some reasons that I can give. So I'm going to give you five reasons uh, why I believe that it's a blessing and why uh, it is a good thing to be a good giver. So number one, I want you to notice that I give because, first of all, I'm blessed when I give. Would you say amen to that? I, I give because I am blessed. If your Bibles are open there, the Matthew chapter 6, you might have to just turn over just a page or two. But let's just pick it up in verse number 25. And let's, let's notice what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Jesus says, For this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life, as what you will eat or what you will drink, not for your body as to what you will put on. For is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you uh, not worth much more than they? And you, uh, who of you by being worried can add one single hour or cubit to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe or look at the lilies of the field grow. They do not uh, toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon, on all of his glory, clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? But do not worry, then saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all those things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. My life first, the next verse. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. How many would say amen to that? Well, here's the interesting thing. When we give, when I give, when our family gives, uh, we are blessed to give. And I believe this, that Christians are the most blessed people on the face of the earth. Uh, God takes not just good care of us, but he takes really good care of us. Why? Because we are his children. Uh, jot this reference down. It's in 1 uh, Peter chapter 2, verse 9 through 12. Uh, listen to what the Apostle Peter says about God's children. It says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you received no mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, the Apostle Peter says, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such a good life among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. Now, I know you don't have that turned in your scripture, and I just gave you the reference, 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse 9 through 12. But let me just uh, go down to the list and again identify you how God treats and calls his children. He tells us that we are a chosen people. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. The scripture says, you be holy just as I am holy. It says that we belong to God as a child of God, meaning we have a relationship with a holy God through his son, Jesus Christ. It says that we are a worshiper of a holy God. It says that one time we did not receive mercy, but now that we have received mercy, you ought to say amen to that. And then it says that we are not of this world. We are strangers. We are aliens. We are foreigners, foreigners in this land. But in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34, I know that you're, you're turned there in your Bible. Would you say amen to that? In Matthew 6, 25 through 34, at least three times Jesus uses this phrase, Do not worry. Do not worry. He says it in verse 25. He says it in verse 28 through 30. He says it again in verse number 34. And three times he tells us not to worry. So if Jesus tells us as his children not to worry, what are we not supposed to do, church? Not to worry. Paul goes even a little bit further than that in Philippians chapter 4. And he says it this way. Do not be anxious for your life. Now let's just call attention to this. Look at verse number 25. In verse number 25, he says, first of all, don't worry about what you put in your body. Look in verse 25 of chapter 6. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for 
your body. So he says here in this passage of Scripture, don't worry about what you put in your body. I'll say more about that in just a moment. Drop down to verse 28 through 30. If verse 25 says, don't worry about what you put in your body, verse 28 through 30 tells us, don't worry about what you put on your body. Verse 28. And why are you worried about what, church? Clothing. Observe or look how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil yet. They do not spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Verse 25, don't worry about what you put in your body. Verse 28 through 30, don't worry about what you put on your body. Look in verse 34. The third, do not worry. Do not worry what you put on, and here's the way I say it, on your agenda. Look in verse 34. Do not worry about when? Tomorrow. For tomorrow will take care of itself. For each day has enough trouble all of its own. You can jot a reference down there. It's James chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. For James said it this way. He said, for you do not know what's going to happen tomorrow. For your life is nothing more than a vapor. It is here one second and it is gone uh, the very next second. Life is short. But what he does tell us to do in this passage of Scripture, three times he tells us not to worry, but what he does tell us in this passage of Scripture is three times he tells us to look. Notice what happens in verse number 26. Are you still with me, church? Verse 26 in the New American Standard. Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap and gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of much more worth than they? So Jesus tells us, that look at the birds of the air. What does God do? God feeds them. Drop down to verse number 28. He says, look at the lilies of the field. What does God do? If God feeds the birds of the air, of the air what does he do with the lilies? God clothes them. Drop down to verse 32 and 33. Uh, he says to look at the Gentiles. The Gentiles were identified as worldly people. They eagerly seek all these things. Clothing, food, everything the world has to offer. But your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. God knows what you need. Now notice this. Key verse. Look in verse 26. The very end of verse number 26. Are you still there? Are you not much worth much more than they? God puts a huge high value on human life. He says to look at the birds, God feeds them. To look at the lilies, God clothes them. But listen, as a child of God, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, don't worry about your clothing, don't worry about the food. God will take care of you. Because he tells us here in verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then how many of these things are going to be added? All these things are going to be added unto you. So one reason that I give is because I'm a blessed person. Number two reason that I give is because I'm loved. And you are loved. Hold your place there in Matthew chapter 6 and turn over to Romans chapter number 8. Uh, we're going to look at a very familiar passage of scripture in Romans chapter number 8. And I love what the Bible says here in Romans chapter 8. Paul writing to the Roma believers there and, and he makes some uh, interesting questions there. He asks a couple questions that are so powerful in nature. Romans chapter 8 verse number 35 and verse 37 through 39. Look at Romans 8 verse 35. It said, who will separate us from what church? The love of Christ will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword and then drop down to verse 37 through verse 39 but in all these things we are overwhelmingly conquered through him or we are conquerors through him who loved us for i am convinced paul said i am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels or principalities nor things are present nor things to come or powers nor height nor debt nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of god which is in christ jesus our Lord. I give, first of all, because I'm blessed. You ought to give, dear friends, because you are blessed by a holy God. But the second reason that I give is because I'm loved by a holy God. Several times in verse 35 all the way through verse 39, it talks about the love of God. It talks about the love of Christ. As a matter of fact, look at verse 35. 
said, who will do what? Separate us. Drop down to verse 39. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God. That word actually has two or three different meanings to it. To separate is the same word that is used back in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 and is the word divorce or it is the word to tear asunder. And the Bible says what God has joined together, let no man do what? Tear asunder. And here's what he is saying. He is saying, who will separate us from the love of God? Nothing. What will separate us from the love of God? Absolutely nothing. How many of you know John chapter 3 and verse 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal or everlasting life. Can I sing a song to you this morning, church? Would you say amen to that? And maybe you might know this song, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. Boy, you guys don't sing like that, like you believe that. Most of you only know that first verse. Let me read to you the words of the second, third, and the fourth verse. I won't sing the chorus. The second verse goes, Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gates to open wide. He will wash away my sin. Let his little child come in. Jesus loves me, loves me still, though I'm very weak and ill. From his shining throne on high comes to watch me where I lie. Jesus loves me, he will stay close beside me all the way. If I love him when I die, he will take me home on high. Can I get an amen to that? Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. But I want you to notice what he says here in Romans chapter 8. Because two things jump off the page in Romans chapter 8, first of all, in verse number 35, he says, No one can separate me from the love of Christ. He says, Who will? He doesn't say what, but he says, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? You say, Now, wait a minute. And then he makes a list there. He says, Tribulation and distress and persecution and famine and nakedness and peril and sword. Now, those are all things. Those are all uh, we could say some objects of things. But how many of you, if you go down through that list in verse 35, could put a name next to each and every one of those characteristics? How many of you have had somebody that's caused a tribulation in your life? How many of you have had somebody that's called distress in your life? How many of you had somebody that has persecuted you? How many of you have had somebody that's denied you a meal? Could I get a witness? Amen. Now, I want to call your attention to something because it says... No one can separate us from the love of God. Tribulation can't, distress can't, persecution can't, famine can't, nakedness can't, peril can't, and the sword can't. Those are all personalized. And then famine. We were up in Indianapolis on uh, Thursday and Friday. On Friday, I happened to uh, meet a couple guys, and um, um, it was interesting with the conversation that we had. We, we listened to some podcasts, and... I don't know if you all know what's happening. You know, they tell us there's a cattle shortage. They tell us there's a meat shortage. They tell us there's an egg shortage. They tell us there's a bread shortage. They tell us all these other shortages. And they have been spending thousands and thousands and millions of dollars on commercials paying Hollywood actors and actresses to tell you that what's coming is they want you to start eating bugs. Not your head. Yeah, Nicole Kidman in a bowl, eating bugs. That's going to be your nourishment. Do you know that, you know who's buying up all the farmland in the United States of America today? China. You know where they're buying all that farmland? Next to our military bases. You, you don't think they're doing all this stuff by accident, right? They're starving their people. You know what they're going to do? They're going to starve our people. 
tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. So we're going to start eating bugs. You all are going to start eating bugs. That's why we are preppers. That's why Teresa has been a cannon fool here over the last several uh, weeks in our garden. We've got tomato juice. We've got green beans. We've got all kinds of things. She's going to start canning meat. I talked to this guy. I told you I met this guy the other day. He said he didn't know where it was, but in some grocery store somewhere, they have locked in a locked case so you can't steal it. Spam. Cans of spam because that's the next thing that you're going to be narrowed down to. But Jesus says here in this passage of Scripture, no matter what it is, nothing, no one can separate you from the love of Christ. But not only that, look what happens in verse 38 and 39 as I go on. Not only does he say no one, but he says nothing can separate us from the love of God. He said, I'm convinced, I, I, am, I am persuaded that death or life or excuse me, angels or principalities or things present or things to come or powers, height, death, any other created thing will be able to tear asunder, separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, you say, well, how in the world is that even possible? Let me tell you three quick things about the love of God. It's not going to be on the screen. Number one is this. The love of God, first of all, is supernatural. It is above. It is other than. It is a sacrificial, supernatural kind of love. Secondly, it is a sacrificial kind of a love. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us in place of, of us. I'm a firm believer in this, that if I was the only person ever born on the face of the earth, I was still born in depravity. I was still born as a sinner. God still would have sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sin because the Bible says that I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. And Jesus said it this way, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And how many? No one comes to the Father except through me. You can talk to every religion that, that you want to down the line, and they can tell you that there's 15 different ways to get to heaven. But listen, dear friends, I'm just a narrow-minded Baptist preacher, and I believe what the Bible says, and the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the only way, is the only truth, and he's the only life, and no one gets to the kingdom of God unless you come by and through in the manner of what Jesus said. And it's through confession of our sin, repentance of our sin, and uh, repenting from our sin and trusting Jesus as our personal Savior and love. It is a supernatural love. It's a sacrificial love. But it's also God's love as a securing kind of a love. Jot this verse down. John chapter 10. I love what, the, what Jesus says in John chapter 10. He says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And notice what he says. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. For my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I don't know what your religious background is. I don't know what it, what it was when, before you came here to this church, whatever you believed in whatever denomination. Some denominations believe you could lose your salvation. The Bible is very clear. You cannot lose your salvation because if you can lose your salvation, then you have denied what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. The Bible says that he came to die for the sin of mankind. The Bible tells us that there is one sacrifice that was made, and that was the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. And if you believe that you can be lost and saved and lost and saved and lost and saved, you are re-crucifying our Savior, Jesus Christ, all over again. And the Bible says that the shedding of the blood of Jesus was sufficient to cover the sin of all mankind. Would you say amen to that? I give, first of all, because I'm blessed. I give, secondly, because I'm loved. Jot this verse down. Number three, I give, third, because I've been forgiven. Uh, I've been forgiven of my sin. Uh, jot this reference down. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. Listen to what uh, Paul said. He said, he has delivered us. You can put your name down there. He has delivered me from the power of darkness and conveyed or transferred us into the kingdom of of his son, of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. I like the way that Paul said this. Jot this reference down. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and listen to what Paul said, of whom I am chief. 
Paul is saying this. Paul is saying, if there was a any sinner born on the face of the earth that was the worst of the worst of the worst, Paul is saying, that's me. But he goes even further than that. He includes everyone. He says that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul said, I'm the worst of all of them. You say, well, how can he say this? How, how does Paul say that he's the worst of, the, of all the sinners? Because he talks about three things. Everybody still with me? Number one is this. He said, where his previous location was. He said, I was in darkness. You know where you were? You were in darkness, your previous location. Secondly, the pleading of our case. You say, well, what's the pleading of our case? The Bible says there in Colossians chapter 1, we have redemption through his blood. Jesus came and took the stand for us. Jesus came and took our place. You didn't shed your, your blood for your sin. Jesus shed his blood for our sin. The previous location was darkness. The pleading of our case was redemption through his blood. But the picking of the lock, the Bible said he is the one who delivers us from our bondage and our sin through the forgiveness of our sin. He picked the lock. He unlocked us from the bondage of our sin. Can I sing you another song? There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains and sinners plunge beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. When Jesus saved you, my dear friends, he not only forgave you of your sin, but he delivered you from the bondage of that sin, and he redeemed you, which means he bought you back, and he washed the slate clean. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord, you are in a sinful condition, and Jesus can wash away your sin. Can I get an amen? amen. Number four. I give because I'm blessed. I give because I'm loved. I give because I'm forgiven. Number four, I give because I'm protected. Go back to Matthew chapter 6. If you would so quickly, uh, just, uh, in just for just a moment, Matthew chapter 6, I give because I am uh, protected. He says here in Matthew 6 and verse number 20, he says, But store up for yourself treasures in heaven, here's the protection, where neither moth nor the rust destroys, or where thieves do not break in and steal. Uh, do you remember Job, the story of Job, the account, how Satan claimed that God had done what? Placed what around him? A hedge of protection around him. A hedge uh, meaning he, that God had built a fence up around him so nothing could get to him. So I jotted down a couple of things. And we've been uh, married 43 years, been together 45 years, and we've accumulated a few things. You have accumulated a few things, right? Uh, some of you are, are like the guy in the sword. In, in the scripture it says, I know what I do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build more barns and bigger barns. Any, any witness are here to that? You know what I'm talking about? I jotted these things down. Everything that I have, I had from God. Everything that I have from God, I'm to be a good steward of those things. Amen? And what I have from God... I need to keep in the right perspective before God. You say, well, what are you talking about? I've told you before, do not hold too tightly to the things of this world. Because, listen, friends, you will not take it with you. You won't. Notice what happens in this passage of Scripture. I am commanded to do something with what God has given to me. First of all, he says in verse 19, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. Why? Because moth and rust destroy where thieves break in and steal. If I store up things on here, here on earth, it's going to decay. It's going to destroy. It's going to get driven off. I'm going to wake up one day. I'm going to look out and my trailer's going to be gone. I'm going to look out and my car's going to be gone. Somebody's going to take off with something. Some thief is going to break in and steal. Do not store up treasures here on earth. However, he does say in verse number 20, he tells us to do store up treasures in heaven. Everybody listen up for just a moment. Jesus is driving a stake right where it belongs. What Jesus is talking about here is a heart issue. Because he says in verse 21, where your treasure is, there what, church? Your heart is also. 
where your treasure is, if it's on the earth, that's where your heart's going to be. If it's in heaven, that's where your heart's going to be. You say, well, what are some ways that we can store up treasures in heaven? There's a long list I could give you. But let me just give you three or four of them. I think when you witness to someone for Jesus Christ, I think that you're storing up treasures in heaven. When you open your mouth, you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and you tell someone about what Christ can do for them, I believe that you are storing up treasures in heaven. I think when you disciple another convert, another believer in Christ, when you walk alongside a, a new convert, a man, a woman, a boy or a girl, and you start sharing them the things about Jesus Christ, how they can grow, I believe that is a treasure that you are building up in heaven. If you are faithful to God's church, uh, some would say, well, every time the doors are open. What I'm talking about is just being faithful to God's church by giving and coming and attending and participating. I, I think you're storing up treasures in heaven. I think when you give uh, to God's kingdom work, one of the things we don't do anymore since, pre, since COVID was we don't pass the offering plate. Now we put it in a, a little box out in the front. But when you give to God's kingdom work, I believe you're storing up treasures in heaven. And then when you do, like some of you did here in the last week, uh, when you serve, and, and Bobby Myra wanted me to, to, to thank those of you who helped serve at the Ark of Barron County. I don't know how many were there. We saw some pictures of that. But I think when you serve others in the name of Jesus, when you give out a cup of water in the name of Jesus to someone else, I believe you are storing up treasures in heaven. So I give, we give because we're blessed. We give because we're loved. We give because we've been forgiven. We give because we're protected. And lastly, this morning, we give because, or I give because I'm committed. Look in verse number 24. In, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, God and wealth, God and money. I believe here in the church, and in many churches today, I believe that we have an allegiance problem. I believe that we are trying to straddle the fence. I believe that we're trying to live for the world and have the stuff from the world, and I think we're trying to live for God at the same time. I think many of us want the best of both worlds, so we buy into the world system and try, and then at some point in time try to fit God in there somewhere because we're supposed to do that. But here in this passage of Scripture, Jesus says, Who can serve two masters? What does he say? No one. No man could serve two masters. Jot this verse down, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, they are not of the Father, but they are of the world. And the world is passing away. What's it doing, church? It's passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God will abide forever. Verse 24, Jesus tells us, here is an emotional connection. Look in verse 24. I'm just about done. In verse 24, notice the emotional words that he uses. Hate, love, devoted, despise. Those are all strong words, but they reveal what our commitment is and where our commitment is. It's either to something or someone. Jesus said, "You will. no man can serve two masters. You will either hate the one and love the other, or devoted to one, and despise the other. You know 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10? Nod your head. You know it? Paul said, for money is the root of all evil. I've got a couple of you shaking your heads. Like I did, did I say that wrong? Yes, I said it wrong. Because if Paul said that money is the root of all evil, he would have pulled the emotional side of it out. But what does Paul do? Paul says the what? The love of money is the root of all evil. You see the emotional connection there? The love of money, that's the emotional connection. Not only is it an emotional connection here in verse 24, but it's also something that comes down to a trust issue. So I'm just about done, and I'm just about ready to get in trouble by some of you. I know I'm about to get ready to do this. But I'm just going to say it like it is. Can I say, can I do that? Can you say amen to that? It is a trust issue. He says, no one can serve two masters. 
He begins in that, verse 24. Then, at the end of verse 24, you cannot serve God and mammon, or wealth, or money. It is a trust issue as well. Let me ask you a question. Who is your master? Who do you trust today? So, I don't know. Well, let me give you some ideas. Do you trust Jesus or you trust the government? Okay. Do you trust Jesus or the CDC, the Center for Disease Control? You're getting quiet. Do you trust Jesus or do you trust the FBI? Do you trust Jesus or do you trust the IRS? 87,000 more agents. They're coming for you. The, in, in their standard, in their written law of their purview says that they can be armed and can use force. Do you trust Jesus or the WHO, the World Health Organization? Do you trust Jesus or you trust Tony Fauci? Boy, I'm getting down here. Some, some of you, I know where you're standing on this. Do you trust Jesus or do you trust your financial advisor? And one more. Do you trust Jesus or do you trust all your politicians? Whether you know this or not, for those of you that are no longer working and you are not earning an income, but yet you are earning investment income, they are coming after your investment income. Nod your head. They're doing it. Why do you think they just hired 87,000 more IRS agents? Remember, Jesus didn't say, he, he didn't. He, he said, "Don't worry about all that stuff because I got it under my control. I've got it under my control, which means Jesus is saying you need to trust me. So if no man can serve two masters, either you're going to hate the one, love the other, devoted one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Why are we spinning our wheels trying to do that? Why are we trying to please man and trying to please Jesus at the same time when it is literally impossible to do?" I promise, give me two more minutes. Let me give you a couple of illustrations. 36% of Americans, listen, 36% of Americans don't, do not have enough money on hand to cover a $400 emergency. Almost half. 36% of Americans don't have $400 on hand to cover an emergency. Almost half of American families have no retirement savings. Most pastors don't. Most Americans have somewhere between $1,000 and $5,000 in their savings account with an average amount of $4,500. That's quite a bit of money. But here's the thing that sort of blew me away. Averages today, average mortgage payments and average car payments. Here's where I'm going to get myself in trouble. Average mortgage payments today, a 30-year fixed loan, the average monthly payment is $2,064 a month. If you drop that down to a 15-year rate, that payment's going to go up to $3,059 a month. Average car payment today, new car, you ready? $644 a month. If you lease that car, $531 a month. If you buy a used car, a good used car, and put it on a payment plan, $488 per month. You say, well, why do you give these numbers? Well, the reason why I give you these numbers today is to help us understand that many of us as believers, our allegiance is not to God. Our allegiance is to the world and the scripture and Proverbs comes to light that we have become a slave to the lender and not a slave to God. All right? So when church is over, I'm going out this door because I know some of you are going to chase me down. <laughs> but I've got a car payment, and I can afford that car payment, and all the other stuff. And I, you, do, you do what you're going to do. I, 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 that, you, you all do just what you're going to do. I think that's a commercial on one of those police shows, isn't it? What you're going to do, what you're going to do, they're going to come for you. 
Y'all watch the same programming I do, don't you? So. Can I encourage you as your pastor to work, I mean, and work to do whatever it takes to get out of debt? You can have a house payment. A house payment is not considered debt. That's, that's an investment that you have. But other stuff that the world has to offer and we buy into and we keep getting that thing every month, that $15, $20, $30, uh, whatever it is, I can afford A, B, C, whatever it might be. It's only $25 a month, $30 a month, whatever it might be. What I want to encourage you, dear friends, is you are a slave to the lender and if you would get freed up from that and there's a need in the church or whatever it might be, and I'm not begging for money, I'm just telling you that if you are freed up from bondage of debt and there is a need and God puts that need on your heart, you can look in your pocketbook or your billfold or you can look in your bank account and say, you know what, I've got an extra 50 bucks, I've got an extra $100, I can help out with that and I don't have to worry about somebody chasing me down. You say, well, it just didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen overnight for us. It took us 20 plus years to get out of debt. But I want to tell you, dear friends, it will free you up that way when someone says that there is a need, you can take some money out of your pocket and you don't have to worry about that being given off to someone else. It breaks my heart to see so many young people that just buy into the world system and get into such massive debt. And they don't understand that they become a slave to the lender. And please hear me. I'm not a banker. I'm not a financial person. And I'll get you out of here. I know I've said that a long time, but I guess I'm not going to get you out of here. Well, you need to build your credit. So you need to go into debt. You need to get credit cards. You need to get all those other things, whatever it might be. And uh, please hear me. Jesus doesn't say anything like that. Jesus says, seek me first. And the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added into you. I would rather, rather have Jesus take care of me than somebody on the outside take care of me. Amen? Amen? Paul said it this way, On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there would be no collections when I come. Jesus said, you, No one can serve two masters. Joshua said it this way, in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, you all can quote it with me, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. We're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation, I believe, uh, Living for Jesus, hymn 282. I believe Steve and Julie are going to help us out with that today. Lord God, we pray that you, uh, that our folks have heard the word today. Lord, I pray that you would direct our thoughts. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts about things going on in our lives and in our hearts. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today that has yet to come to know Christ as their personal Savior and Lord, would today be that day of salvation for them? And Lord, if there's something else that we need to bring before you, Lord, if we're struggling financially, Lord, and we're, we're trying to figure some things out, God, uh, we pray that we bring it to the altar, Lord. We need your help. We need to trust you with it. Depend on you. And we'll be careful to give you the praise for that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's all stand. If you need to come, you please come. Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that we do, yielding allegiance, glad hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessings for me. Oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee. For Thou in Thine atonement is give Thyself to me. I owe no other master my heart shall be my throne. My life I give henceforth to live. O Christ, for Thee alone. Living for Jesus, who died in my 
sin and disgrace. Such love constrains me to answer his call. Follow his leaning and give him my all. Oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee. For thou in thine atonement didst give thyself for thee. No other master, thy heart shall be thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. Amen. Would you be seated for just a moment? Is there an unpacking next Sunday? Okay. Yeah, next Sunday. 17th, right? Yeah, you can turn this off. You can, you can turn Facebook off, yeah. Okay. Yes, next Sunday evening.